Chapter Two of In the Field, nineteen fourteen, nineteen fifteen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by F. N. H. In the Field, nineteen fourteen, nineteen fifteen, by Marcel Dupont. Chapter Two, The First Charge. September Four. Six o'clock in the evening. The atmosphere was heavy and stifling. The regiment had been formed into two columns, to the right and to the left of the high road from Vauchamps to Montmirail. The men, tired out, their faces black with dust, had hardly dismounted when they threw themselves on the ground and slept in a field of cut corn. The officers chatted together in groups to keep themselves awake. Nights are short when you're on campaign. The bivouac was pitched at midnight and was to be struck at three o'clock in the morning. And since six o'clock, the battle had been raging, for the enemy had engaged our rear guard almost immediately. This had happened each day of that regrettable retreat, begun at the Sambre and pushed on to the Marne. Each day we had had to fight. Each day the enemy was repulsed. Each day we were obliged to retire. Brother soldiers, you who came through those painful hours, shall you ever forget them? Shall you ever forget the anguish that wrung our hearts when, as the sun was sinking, you, who had seen so many of your comrades fall, had to give up further portion of our sweet France, to deliver up some of our lovely hamlets, some of our fields, our orchards, our gardens, some of our vineyards to these barbarians? You were ordered to do so. We have learnt since then how important such sacrifices were, but at the time we did not know and doubt came into our minds. We passed through cruel days, and nothing will ever efface the impression of physical and moral prostration that came over us. The regiment was sleeping, tired out. Alone, calm, phlegmatic, the colonel kept watch, standing in the middle of the road. With his pipe between his teeth, beneath his ruddy drooping moustache, his cap pulled down over his eyes, his arms crossed on the light blue tunic, he seemed to be ever watchful shepherd of that immense flock. At such moments the chief must be able to seem unconscious of the self-abandonment, the disorder and the exhaustion of his men. Human powers have their limits. They had been expended for days without stint. Every moment of cessation from actual fighting had to be a moment of repose. The important thing is that the chief should keep watch. Brave little chasseurs, sleep in peace. Your colonel is watching over you. I looked at the men of my troop, on the ground in front of their horses. How could I recognize the smart, brilliant, accoutred horsemen, whose uniforms used to make such a gay note in the old-fashioned streets of the little garrison town? Under the battered shakos, with their shapeless peaks, the tanned, emaciated faces looked like masks of wax. Youthful faces had been invaded with beards, which made them look like men of thirty or more. The dust of roads and fields raised by horses, wagons, and limbers had settled on them, showing up their wrinkles and getting into eyes, noses, and moustaches. Their clothes, patched as chance allowed during a halt under some hedge, were enamels of many coloured pieces. A few more days with such unremitting war, and we should have vied with the glorious Tatterdemalions of the army of Italy and the sombre of Meuse as Raffet paints them. With their noses in the air, their mouths open, their eyes half shut, my chasseurs lay stretched out among the legs of their horses and slept heavily. Poor horses! Poor pretty creatures so delicate, so fiery in their glossy summer coats! They had followed their master's fortunes. How many of them had already fallen under the Prussian bullets? How many had been left dying of exhaustion or starvation after the terrible rides? They seemed to sleep, absorbed in some miserable dream of nothing but burdens to carry, blows to bear, and wounds to suffer. They were hanging their heads, but had not even the strength to crop the green blades growing here and there amongst the stalks of corn. I felt uneasy, wondering whether they would still be equal to an effort for the fight that was always likely and always desired. Suddenly, from the ridge some eight hundred yards behind us, coming down like a bolt, I saw a horse at full gallop. Its rider was gesticulating wildly. Strange to say, though, not a word had been said, as though awakened by an electric current, every man had got up and had fixed his astonished eyes on the newcomer. 
He was an artillery non-commissioned officer. His face was crimson, his hair unkempt. His cap had come off his head and was dangling by the chin-strap. With a violent jerk he pulled up his foaming horse for a second. "'Where is the Colonel? The Colonel!' With one voice the whole squadron replied, "'There on the road! What's the matter?' He had already set off again at full speed, had reached the Colonel, and was bending down towards him. Even at that distance we could hear some of his words. "'Ulands! Near the woods! Our guns! Our teams!' Then it was like a miracle. Without any word of command, without any sign, in a moment the whole regiment was on horseback, sword in hand. The Colonel alone had remained standing. With the greatest calmness he asked the sergeant in an undertone for some information, and the man answered with emphatic gestures. All eyes were fixed upon the group. Everybody waited breathlessly for the order which was going to be given and repeated by five hundred voices, by five hundred men drunk with joy. We believed the glorious hour was at last come, which we had been awaiting with so much impatience since the opening of the campaign, the charge. That indescribable thing which is the raison d'etre of the trooper, that sublime act which pierces, rends, and crushes by a furious onslaught, wild gallop with the uplifted sword, yelling mouth and frenzied eyes, the charge. The charge of our great ancestors, of those demigods, Murat, Lasalle, Curley, Kellerman, and so many others. The charge we had been asking for with all our hearts ever since the opening of the campaign, and which had always been denied us. Ah, that famous German cavalry, that set up its doctrine of pushing the attack to the death. What hatred and what contempt we had conceived for them. We had one desire, and only one, to measure ourselves with them, and every time we had seen their squadrons, the result had been either that they had turned and retired in good order behind their lines of infantry, or they had drawn us into some ambuscade, under the pitiless fire of their deadly machine-guns. Were we at last to meet them, and measure our swords with their lances? The regiment moved off in one body behind the colonel, who was riding a big chestnut horse as calm as at manoeuvres, led us at a gentle trot, skirting little clumps of trees that dotted the plain. A troop had gone forward in a halo of glittering dust to act as an advance guard. Our horses seemed to have understood what we were about, or was it we who had passed on to them the fighting spirit that fired us? I felt behind me the thrill that ran through my men. The first rank could not manage to keep the correct distance, the yard and a half, which ought to separate it from its leader. Even the corporal in the centre allowed his horse to graze the haunches of mine. Torn to jours, my gallant charger, the fiery thoroughbred which had so often maddened me at riding schools of the regiment and at manoeuvres, by his savageness and the shaking he gave me. Torn to jours gave evident signs of excitement by his pawing the ground every now and then. He, an officer's horse, seemed to resent the close proximity of mere troop horses. And certainly, under ordinary circumstances, I should have fallen foul of the rider impudent enough to ride close to his heels. But on that occasion I merely laughed in my sleeve, knowing that in a few minutes, when the charge had begun, torn to jours, would soon have made them all keep their proper distance, and something more. I took a pleasure in looking at the faces of the men of the third squadron, whose troops were riding in column abreast of us. Their chins were raised, their eyes wide open, intent, under the shade of their cap peaks, upon the slightest irregularities of the ground ahead. Their hands grasped their sword hilts tightly. Major B, leaning well forward and riding between the two squadrons, was practising some furious cutting strokes. What a grand fight it was going to be! How we should rejoice to see the curved sabres of our comrades rising against the clear sky to slash down upon the leather chapasques of our foes! We waited for the word that was to let loose the pent-up energy of all those tense muscles. A trooper came back from the advance guard at full speed, and brought up his horse with the spur beside the colonel. He reported in short sentences, which we could not hear. The colonel turned towards our captain, who was behind him, leaning forward over his horse all attention, and with his sword lowered, receiving the orders given in an undertone. We only heard the last sentence. I shall support you with the rest of the regiment. Thank heaven, thought I. It is we, it is our dear squadron that is to have the honour of attacking first. Every man pulled himself together. 
Every man felt conscious of all the glory in store for us. Every man prepared to perform exploits which, we felt sure, would astonish the rest of the regiment of the army and of France. Forward! 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 The troops had already ridden past the colonel at an easy gallop, and we suddenly found ourselves strangely isolated in that vast tract of country, which a few minutes before we had passed over in a body. There was a succession of yellow and green fields, with here and there some leafy thicket. On our left, surrounded by orchards, rose the grey and massive buildings of the farm of Bel Air. In front of us, some few hundred yards off, there was a dark line of wood, the lower part of which was hidden from us by a slight rise in the ground. Hardly had the first troop reached the top of the brow when some shots were fired at us. We at once understood. Again we were to be deprived of the pleasure of measuring ourselves with the Ulands at close quarters. We saw distinctly on the edge of the wood, kneeling and ready to fire, some fifty sharpshooters in grey uniform and round caps with peaks. We recognised them easily. It was one of their cyclist detachments that had slipped into the wood and had been quietly waiting for us with rifles levelled. As usual, their cavalry had retired under the cover of their line. What did it matter to us? The wood was not thick enough to prevent our horses from getting through, and the temptation to let the fellows have a taste of our steel was too strong. I rejoiced at the thought of seeing their heavy boots scuttle away through the trees. I resolved to have a thrust at the skirts of their tunics, to help them on a bit. The captain understood the general feeling. "'Form up!' he cried. In a twinkling... A moving wall had been formed, to the music of merrily clinking stirrups and scabbards and jangling metal, and the gallop towards the wood began. Just at that moment its skirts were outlined by a circle of fire, and a violent fusillade rang out. Bullets whistled in all directions, and behind me I heard the heavy sound of men and horses falling on the hard ground. In my troop a horse without a rider broke away and came galloping towards me. What did it matter? Forward! Forward! We were about two hundred yards off. We spurred our horses and got into our stride. Suddenly a horrible fear took the place of the martial joy that had urged us to the fight. We were all struck by the same discouragement, the same feeling of impotence, the same conviction of the uselessness of our sacrifice. We had just realised that the edge of the wood was surrounded with wire, and that it was behind this impassable barrier that the Prussians were calmly firing at us as at a target. What was to be done? How could we get at them and revenge our fellows who had fallen? For one second a feeling of horror and impotent rage passed, like a deep wave over the squadron. The bullets whistled past us. But the captain adopted the wisest course. He saw that retreat was necessary. He had, behind him, more than a hundred human lives, and felt they must be saved for better and more useful sacrifices. With a voice that rose above the noise of the firing, he shouted, "'Follow me! In open order!' And he spurred in an oblique direction towards the nearest depression in the ground. But the movement was badly carried out. The men, disheartened, instead of spreading out like a flight of sparrows, rushed off in so compact a body that some more horses were knocked over by the Prussian bullets. How long had those few seconds seemed to us? I wondered by what sort of miracle it was that we did not lose more men. But what an uncanny tune the innumerable bullets made in our ears as they pursued us like angry bees. At last we got under cover. Following a gully, the squadron reached a little wood, behind which it was able to reform. The sweating horses snorted loudly. The men, sullen-mouthed and dejected, fell in without a word and dressed the line. In the fading light, the roll was called by a non-commissioned officer in a subdued voice, whilst I looked on distressfully at the sad results of the useless charge. And yet our losses were not great. Three troopers only, slightly wounded, who, far from grumbling at their mishap, seemed proud of the blood that stained their tunics and their hands. The men whose horses had fallen had already come up jogging heavily over the field of Lucerne that stretched out before us. One man alone was absent, Parquin, a good little fellow, energetic and well-disciplined, whose good humour I found especially attractive, both under fire and in camp. But he would come in, no doubt. Calhard, his bedfellow, told me that his horse had stumbled and thrown him. He thought he had even seen him get up directly after the charge had passed. "'Mon lieutenant! Mon lieutenant! Your horse is wounded!' I had dismounted in a moment, and tears came to my eyes. 
I had forgotten the anger and impatience that Tourne Toujours' savage temper had so often caused me. What had they done to my brave and noble companion in arms? A bullet had struck him inside the left thigh, and penetrating it had made a horrible wound as large as my hand, from which the blood was streaming all down his leg. Two other bullets had hit him, one in the flank and the other in the loins, leaving two small red holes. The noble animal had brought me safely back, and then, as he still stood on four trembling legs, his neck raised, his nostrils dilated, his ears pricked, he fixed his eyes on the distance, and seemed to look approaching death in the face. Poor Torn Tajours! You could not divine the pain I felt as I patted you gently, as gently as I should touch a little suffering child. But I had to shake off the sadness that wrung my heart. The day was gradually sinking, and Paquin had not come in. Two of the men quickly put my saddle on the horse of one of the wounded troopers, while Surgeon Major P., in the growing dusk, attended to the seriously wounded men stretched on the grass. I made up my mind to go out and see whether my little chasseur was not lying out on the scene of the charge. Cahurt, Finet, Monette, Valley, I want you. At a gentle trot we sailed out from the cover of the wood. My four men dispersed at wide intervals to the right and left, stood up in their stirrups from time to time, to get a better view. The guns were silent. Now and again one or two isolated shots were heard. Night had almost fallen. On the horizon a long reddish streak of light still gave a feeble glow. Everything was becoming blurred and mysterious. In front of us stretched the disquieting mass of the wood that so lately had rained death on us. Above our heads flocks of black birds were wheeling and croaking. Bakwin! 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 My chasseurs shouted their comrade's name, but no voice answered. We were certainly on the ground the squadron had ridden over. Every now and then we came across the body of a horse, marking our mournful course. A poor mare with a broken leg neighed feebly, as if appealing for help to her stable companions. Paquin! 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 No response. We had to turn back and rejoin the others. War has many of these moments of pain when we have to control our feelings. Forget those we love, those who are suffering, those who are dying, and think of nothing but our regiment, our squadron, our troop. Puckwin's name would be marked on the roll as missing, a solemn word which means so many things, a word that leaves a little hope but gives rise to so many fears. Over the fields, under a brilliant moon, the squadron retired in silence. Those who have served in war know that solemn moment when, after a day's fighting, each corpse arrives at its appointed place of rest. It is the moment when in normal life nature falls asleep in the peace of the evening. It is the moment when in villages and farms lights appear in the lower windows behind which the family is seated around a steaming soup tureen after the day's work. It is some time now since we have tasted the exquisite peace of those moments. Instead, we have grown used to hearing over a wide country a monotonous and barbarous uproar caused by the thousands of cannon, limbers, vans, and vehicles of every kind, which are the very life of an army. All these things rumble along methodically in the dark, clanking and creaking, towards a goal invisible and yet sure. Above this huge chaos, voices rise in various keys. Soldiers astray, asking for their road, Van drivers urging on their foot-sore teams, words of command given by leaders striving in the dark to prevent confusion among their units. This is the reverse of the shield of battle, the moment when we feel weariness of mind and body, and the infinite sadness of remembering those who are no more. Away in the distance, two villages were in flames, luridly lighting up some corners of the scene. That evening seemed to me sadder and more distressing than ever. End of chapter 2. Recording by FNH. Visit www.bookranger.co.uk.